Hi, Sarah from Sarah Humphrey Embroidery. So I've got another book to show you today and we're not going to look at a technique so much this time as a, a person. So we're going to look at Mae Morris, Arts and Crafts Designer. So just looking through this book again has inspired me to do a design um, of my own based on this. So that will be coming later. So do keep your eye out for that to see what it is and how you can get your hands on it. But let's have a look at the book first. So May was the younger daughter, the youngest daughter of William Morris. So he was one of the founders of the arts and crafts movement. But he was extremely popular and successful. Um, and this overshadowed May a little bit. So this book is really good um, for addressing that and looking at the talents that May had herself. So here is May and her family. So this is May Morris here. So here's her mother, Jane Morris, who you may have heard of. Um, and this is her father, William Morris, a um, cheery looking lot. <laughs> <laughs> don't look very happy um but may was brought up into a household um full of crafts full of arts and crafts um because william morris had started his business just as may was born so it was a bit inevitable really that she was going to be involved in it and um his wife jane she did embroidery she actually taught may embroidery and she did all the embroidery um for the business along with her sister and their friends as well so it was definitely a family affair so may was involved right from the very beginning surrounded by all these wonderful um wonderful skills and arts and crafts. So this is Mae Morris here looking quite thoughtful in this photograph um, and I just wanted a quick look at her education because it sounds rather lovely. So um, she was homeschooled for a while but then she enrolled at the National Art Training School which later became the Royal College of Art so that was in South Kensington so near to the Victoria and Albert Museum as we know it now um, and she actually chose embroidery as her specialism um, as part of the course, she studied medieval embroidery known as Opus Anglicanum. We've got loads of videos on that, so do check out that if you're not sure what that is. Um, and she made watercolour records of ancient artworks, wildflowers and landscapes. Um, so she studied um, art as well as embroidery and right from a very early age. And at the age of just 23, she took over the embroidery side of Morris & Co. And she actually ran the embroidery workshop. So she must have already been a very accomplished embroiderer by then. Her mother taught her embroidery. So at the age of 23, she was very accomplished and she took over that part of the business. So it's already said that she did a lot of sketching um, and she did this throughout her life, actually. Um, and she did a lot of watercolours and a lot of sketches. And here's a couple of the ones that she did. So these are view of Count, views of Kelmscott Manor, which was their sort of summer home. So it was very, uh, very handy to have these beautiful places to draw, very envious of her. So she did these beautiful little drawings of them, very accomplished drawings. Some more, so some of the inside of them here. This is a tapestry room in Kelmscott Manor. This is the outside of it. And these drawings come into her work later, just to show the skills that she had in doing this and how that helped her design, helped her to design her embroideries later. This is a villa that they stayed in in um, Italy, um, a castle with some friends that they stayed at. So all very, uh, very luxurious places, but she does these beautiful paintings and drawings. And she did some copies as well. So just lots and lots of sketching and drawing. Something I really believe in um, if you want to design your own embroideries, if you're thinking of doing your own um, drawing, um, will definitely help with that process. Some of the inside. This is her bedroom. She was also very interested in botanical sketches. Um, William Morris used quite different um, influences for his designs, but May was very interested in the plants around her and often drew these um, in her sketchbook. And these come into her designs later, as we shall see, but really, really beautiful um, diagrams here. And she was really trying to understand the plants and how they formed. And you can already see in this one a little bit of a design element coming through. This one's more sketch like but you can see where her ideas might be starting to form already. So lots of botanical sketching. So one of the reasons I love this book is I can identify with May a little bit. So she was involved in what was the Royal School of Art Needlework, which is now the Royal School of Needlework, which is obviously where I attended as well. Um, and all the Morris family were. They did designs for the school. Um, but this piece especially, so this was designed by Edward Byrne-Jones, who was one of the Arts and Crafts Movement, um, and William Morris. They designed it together and executed by three embroiderers from the school. But what's interesting about this, that whole project was managed by May. So she went 
went to the school and she oversaw the making of this this piece and this is all embroideries it's absolutely stunning silk on linen if i just look at the size three meters by just over two it's absolutely huge um and she oversaw that so she had this involvement with the school so obviously having been there i understand a little bit of what that's um what that's like so May Morris um, employed people like the Royal School of Needlework did. She had apprentices also in the Morris & Co embroidery studio. Um, and by all accounts, she looked after them very well. She paid them well. Um, and there's a little bit about their accounts as well over here, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, so in a four-year period, so from 1892 to 96, 453 orders for a total of 670 items. Together, altogether, department invoice customers for one thousand one hundred and eighty-six pounds over that four years. That's equivalent of about seventy thousand pounds today over four years, and you've got to pay for your staff as well. So, not a great wage, um, especially when you look at what William Morris bought in in his other parts of his business, which was about ten thousand pounds a year. But this was something that May believed in strongly um, about these arts and crafts and the importance of embroidery, which we'll come back to later as well. But just interesting to see um, the value of it in those days as well. So before May went to work for the embroidery part of Morris & Co, she actually did some designing for her father and she designed some wallpaper, um, which they did at the time. And she actually only designed three wallpapers in her time, but I wanted to look at them because they are very beautiful. Um, and this one particularly in the corner. So this is Honeysuckle. Now there is some um, de debate about who actually designed this. It was originally attributed to William Morris, her father, and then um, it came to light later that it was probably May. Um, putting Morris's name on it, Morris Senior's name on it, um, meant they could probably sell it, um, but it is actually thought to be by May. And what I love about this is this little pit piece of it here, the original drawing, it's such a complex design, but this is the repeat pattern for it. Um, and you can see this square here, and this actually is the bit that repeats. And so you can just see some leaves coming up here and then those same leaves come up here. So that bit would go on the top and you'd get that repeat. And to me, that's mind boggling. I don't even know how they did that. They can do a simple repet um, repetitious design, but, but that just blows my mind a little bit. So I wanted to show you that just to show you already right at the beginning of a career, how complex her design skills were and her mother could embroider and her father could design, but May had the unique talent of being able to do both, um, which is what um, meant that she could create these beautiful designs. So here's the other two she did. So Horn Poppy here and Arcadia here. So again, really, really complex designs for somebody such um, so early on in their career. And then the book goes into her embroidery design specifically. So quite different from William Morris, um, a little bit more feminine, I would have said, not surprisingly. And this is a set that she did. So this is called the Maids of Honour panel. It's actually the same design. Flip back one page, you can see the design here, nice outline design, and you could buy this from their shop. So what the shop did is it would sell finished pieces that would could be stitched for you, or you could buy them yourself and stitch them yourself, which is why um, they often appear in different colourways. So you can see that same design here, but worked in slightly different ways. Um, the birds are slightly different around the edge, but otherwise it's the same design and how different they look to each other. So you could choose your own colourway when you ordered your design saying I want it to match my curtains, my house, my grand house. Um, I'd like these colours. So they would often do that for you and give you a different colourway. Here's some more of her designs. And I think that's what I love most about this book is the highlight it puts on design and shows you how she got from her design to her finished embroideries. So this page is really interesting if you're um, a designer of kits yourself, if you make your own kits or if you've bought a kit or if you've ever done a kit. And this is the process that they used back in the 1800s. Um, and they had an emphasis on... Um, doing things the traditional way and the handmade way rather than a machine. So they didn't print their designs, um, they hand drew them. So this is um, a design for a cushion, for example, cushion cover or a, often a fire screen. And this is drawn on ink um, on cotton. Um, and this cotton would have been treated so it's a bit shiny. And this is what the people in the studio would have used and they would have traced this design 
onto a piece of paper and then they use the prick and pounce method and for anyone who's seen my channel a lot you'll know what that is um, we can put a video on that up here if you don't know what that technique is um, and they would have used that as the master copy and they would have actually drawn the design on the fabric for the customer ready to go out so they would have received a hand drawn design um, the other thing that they did, which is quite surprising and I think I would hate personally, is they would start the stitching for you. So they often came part worked with a little bit of each element done so you could see what to do. Um, I think this is quite funny. It's almost like they didn't trust you to do it yourself to do it yourself and they had to show you how to do it but the chances of you doing it exactly the same as them is quite unlikely they were very experienced you'd have one little corner that was done beautifully and the rest was done in your own hand so I think that would have shown up a bit um, but they stitched this little bit for you to show you how to do it so there's a bit of the background done as well so the whole background on this would have been blue and if you thought oh I, I don't want to do all the background <laughs> you've either got to take that bit out or, or just go and head and fill in all of it. So personally, I wouldn't like that, but it was quite interesting that that was a thing they did. Um, you didn't really request that. Um, you got your kit um, hand-drawn onto the fabric with a little bit stitched and all your colours ready to go. So here's another page of designs along that theme, which is interesting. So um, you could buy the finished thing here. So here's one of um, two panels, I think, um, one of a pair. And this is quite large, two and a half metres by a metre. So it's huge. And this is all hand stitched. And you could buy this from their studio, um, all hand done, ready to hang up in your country state, I should imagine. Um, or you could do it yourself. So they've made small versions. You could buy this as a kit and do the large version, but they did make small versions um, suitable for kits to be finished by a home embroiderer. <laughs> Um, so a little bit smaller and a bit more manageable um, and again you can see here how it's just been started just to show you uh, what you need to be doing and how you need to be doing it um, so these are a couple of kits that were very popular at the school that you could just buy to stitch yourself so the book shows lots of lovely beautiful designs by May really great um, beautiful pictures in here some of her incredible designs if I just want to jump to this one here because I thought this one was really cute and this is quite unlike all the other things that she did and I thought well this one's interesting what's this one about but they also did commissions um, so if you wanted something again to go with something in your house or as a present or whatever you wanted it for you could say I want this um, can you make it for me and there's a little note of a day book that they had which recorded everything that they did in the studio um, with a request to say what's the estimate of how uh, of the cost of designing materials for three small screens and then give some measurements. Um, and the chief point is that owls are to form part of the design. So somebody had requested this specifically and she would design something for them. Um, and I absolutely love these three panels, this little owl on his own. And then he's sort of joined by a little mate at the back, but not getting too close. And then obviously it all works out in the end. <laughs> so really, really cute. So those little owls are going to come back in later as part of my design. So um, just remember that panel because we're going to look at those again later. Again, I love this book because it shows the process and that's something that I'm really keen on myself um, is to design your own pieces. But I just love to see how she did it because they're so complex. Um, but you can see here how she's just worked half of it. She's kind of roughed in the pattern. So you can see these lines where she wants her acanthus sleeves to come through, but she's just worked half of it and she's just going to repeat. So a lot of them were... Um, symmetrical designs but you don't need to draw the whole piece you can just flip it over and draw one side so just concentrate on one side but I just love this sort of construction process um, in pencil quite rough and then she's just brought it up with her colour and with her paintings to make it a complete design so this is the bit I'm really interested in and why I love this because there's so much of her process in this book and you can see how she got from her drawing to her embroidery. So one thing that May did when she got very experienced and she'd made a name for herself was she wrote a book. Um, so it's called Decorative Needlework and this is the cover of it here. Um, it was more of a supplement to her other skills that she did. So she taught as well and she gave lectures too. Um, she had a lot of opinions about embroidery. Um, this isn't a book of how to do this stitch and how to do that, although there is that in it. But she seemed to have to want to explain why that you should do it and why it was good to do it and why it was important to do it. So if you're interested in that, social side especially from women working at the time as well in the Victorian period at the time you might
might be really interested in this book. Um, the good news is, because it's um, quite an old book, is you can get it online. You can view it online. So what we'll do is we'll put a link um, in the description below this video um, where you can see that and you can have a read of it and see what her ideas and her reasoning was um, and have a look at her book on, on decorative needlework. So she also did um, teaching and lectures, as I mentioned. So here are some of her notes for that. And I like the thought that she's just working this out on paper. She's just got these scribbles. They don't look particularly beautiful. Um, I'm sure I don't know what they mean. <laughs> um, but this is her workings out and how much um, she really um, thought about this process and how much effort she put into it. She really, really did believe in this um, as a skill and that you should learn this. Um, and it's full of um, her little drawings as well. And she also, just flick forward a little bit, some more of her painting. So this was a design for a tapestry. So she didn't just do small things. She designed this and drew, drew this for a tapestry. Um, she did book covers. So William Morris had a printing firm as part of his business. Um, and May was obviously surrounded by these things um, and did a lot of her own book covers and designs as well. Just show you one here. So here's the drawing again, beautiful, beautiful drawing. You can see she's not worked the whole of it. She doesn't need to. She's done half of the circle um, here. And then she will just flip that over and copy the other half. You don't need to do the whole thing. And this is it stitched into a book. Quite different how they come out, actually, which is always really interesting. You've got your design, but then what do you do to it when you stitch it? There's a lot more decisions to make at this stage as well. I think that's why I find it so fascinating. Dress and costume. She always used to like to, to dress up a little bit as well. There's some great photos of her. And she did jewellery as well. So in the later part of her life, she wasn't working for the company anymore. She was free to do her own things more and more. She designed some jewellery as well. So she really did a lot of different things, um, which I'm also a strong believer in. Um, try your hand at different techniques. And William Morris did this also. He wanted to understand the processes that went into the things that he was selling and that he was making. And he would do it himself just to have an understanding of it. So something that May Morris did as well and tried her hand at all these different things. So all of this talk of design and looking at May's beautiful drawings and her paintings, I thought um, it would be really fun to design one of my own inspired by May. So I've made you a little design. Yeah, put it down here so you can see it more clearly. Um, and I've just used a couple of her pieces that really inspired me. So here's our little owl friends here that we looked at earlier because I thought they were so sweet. And then I put them on this sort of vine of um, oak leaves, I mean a kind of quite a stylized oak tree. So I've taken that sort of from this centre part of these beautiful panels that she did here and I've put those together and made my own design. Um, so I'm going to put that on the free stuff page of the website. Again we'll put a link below the video. You can print that off for free and you can have a go at that. Um, I will probably have a go at stitching it in another video so if you want to hang on and wait and see how I do it you can or if you just want to jump in and have a go um, yourself then you are absolutely welcome to do that. Um, she used very few different stitches, um, just some of the basic ones. So you you could sort of consider just using um, satin stitches and stem stitches, um, things like that. A darning stitch was a very popular one as well. Or you could do whatever you like with it, I don't mind. But I just thought it would be fun to be inspired by May um, and continue her tradition of designing um, another piece. So this book is absolutely great if, like me, you're interested in design specifically and if you're interested in this period and the social history of this period as well. She was um, she was very active um, socially um, on that front in those times. Um, so if you want to have a copy of this, it's easy to get hold of. Um, it's printed by Thames and Hudson um, and we will put a link to um, the ISBN number and the details um, of that in um, below this video, in the description below this video. So if you want to get your hands on a copy, you can. So I hope you've enjoyed that little delve into the world of May Morris. If you have, then do give us a thumbs up and more people will get to see it. We've got more videos um, about books that I love. We'll put a list up here, playlist of you to go and have a look at if you want to see those as well. We've got another video here that you might really like um, and I'll see you in the next video.